everyone. Today I have with me writer Abigail Thomas. And Abigail wrote this book called What Comes Next and How to Like It. It's a memoir, like all her books. And actually, she's very well known for A Three Dog Life. So thank you so much for talking to me, Abby. Oh, you're very welcome. I'm glad I'm glad you I'm glad you're calling me. <laughs> oh, well, you know, I have had this book in my um Audible. I, I keep an Audible library, okay, and I'm always adding books because I drive a lot. And I didn't realize like how long so I was like going through my list driving one day, and I was like, oh, I didn't get to this book yet. And I, I pop it in, and I was. Uh, do you narrate the book on Audible? I did. Yeah, I believe it or not, that. I did. I thought so when I heard your voice. I was like, I thought you did, and I was just by the end of my trip, I was just. Crying. I mean, what a great memoir oh, this is. It is you. so amazing. And as a woman, like all of your um, ups and downs, I was feeling with you as you were going up and down. I was just like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. And, and it's one of the things I love about memoirs is that you do get to live with, with someone else in their shoes and experience things. And, and it'll take you kind of through something that you've been through, even if it isn't the same. You know, yeah, that's what thanks, I love yeah. about it. And, I'm um, so glad, yeah. Yeah, and so what, you know, I know you have four children. I have six children. So, like, right off the bat, you know, you can understand the the multitude of children running around. And, and, God, and, yes. and <laughs> what, and, and then our grandchildren, you have 12. I only have seven so far, but. You have but seven what, grandchildren? I do. <laughs> I think you are ahead of me at your age. I, I mine got so many because two of my children had twins. That bumps me up from eight to twelve. Yeah, that's just amazing to have. I mean, when I read that, I was like, "Wow!" I mean, that takes you right there. That doubles your it doubles you from two to four right there. It does. My God, I can't believe you have seven grandchildren. You're quite young for that. I won't say how old you are. Yeah, well, and I'm just care about okay. that. It's okay, I but know. I, you know, okay. The weirdest thing happened with my grandchildren, um, <laughs> which is kind of like it's part of the book, but it's kind of off track of the book. But um, my mom had passed away in 2011 and mm-hmm. I was recovering, you know, from going through that. And uh, cause yeah, I took care of her. She, she had cancer. It was fast, but it was still slow. You know what I mean? It was slow and fast, but anyway, so I'm recovering from that. And my one son and his wife get pregnant and she had a miscarriage. And that was the first, you know, pregnancy. So it was like six months after my mom's death, I come across this woman who is a, um, uh, one of those people that talk to dead people, whatever you want to call them, a psychic, whatever. A medium. And medium, right, medium. Or a nut. And she says, the only thing, this is the only thing she says to me. So I'm thinking, okay, you know, I don't tell her that my mom died. You know, I meet her through a friend. And right away she said, your mom has a message for you. And I was like waiting for this profound thank you for everything I did for her when she was dying of cancer or something, you know, because she was very incoherent most of the time. And she said, you're going to have a lot of grandchildren in the next couple of years. They're going to come all at once. Boom, boom, boom. And it did. Oh, my gosh. And it happened. Wow. Right after that miscarriage, they got pregnant. Another son's wife got pregnant. It's like, boom, boom, my daughter got pregnant. They all have two and three kids. Right, right. Within four years, I have seven grandchildren. I didn't know dead people knew the future. I, I didn't. Isn't that bizarre? That's, that's terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you like to <clears> exactly. My God. Like, I, never under, I don't understand any of that. So I don't even know. All I know is that it's a story that I use because it happened. Like it, it happened. Oh, I don't yeah. know how it happened, but it did happen. And that's somehow really I'm like, somehow my mom knew, but I don't know if it was my mom because I don't really know how much I believe that. But whatever it was, <laughs> happened so anyway that's the that's, oh, that's my crazy lovely, grandchildren though. story yes and when people say how old, you have is your oldest, how old how old is four. your oldest grandchild four. Oh god oh my god yeah, yeah. so i'm telling you mine is, mine is 32 <laughs> and my oldest son is 30 yeah so wow that's crazy that's crazy but as you're experiencing you know mothering um what I loved about it, and, and I know every woman my age will, is that no one prepares you for the older child. You know, I feel like when my kids were little, my mom was still around. You know, you're just busy. You're busy, busy. You're just doing things. You're not even thinking, really. And then they grow up, 
And then all of a sudden everything becomes different and weird. And, you know, mm. because I just look at my older children and I'm like, I don't know how to parent you anymore. Like, I don't know what well, to you're say. Not supposed you know? to, but we do anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Whether they like you know, it or not. it's really hard. It's really hard not to give the 56 year old one a lot of advice. <laughs> And she just looks at me. <laughs> but it's so awesome. I mean, not that it's not awesome seeing them get older, because it is. It's awesome, and it's amazing, and they amaze me every day. But I also feel like I don't know what to say. And yet you hurt. I have a daughter right now going through a, something with her boyfriend, and, and I hurt. Like, I, you know, I can't not hurt all the time for it. Like, like when they're little, you can do something about it. You know, you can yeah. fix it. But when they're bigger and they have these bigger problems, you know, all you can do is talk and be there. And and so for, you know, just to tell people a little bit about the book, in, in the book we find out that your daughter has breast cancer. And is that your older daughter or younger daughter? No, that's my youngest daughter. That's okay, my youngest so daughter. that's my young – it's my younger daughter, too, that's having – and it, she feels like my baby, but she's not my baby. But she is my youngest Wait, daughter. Wait, but she doesn't have cancer, does she? She does not. She just is having little problems now in comparison okay. to that. She does not. But I I was, you know, my heart was breaking for you going through it because I'm sure that that's that sensation of, like, how can I help her? How can I help her? You know, how do I fix this? You can't fix it, you know? No, you can't. You're just, you're just there. Mm-hmm. You're just there. Yeah. And is she doing well now? Yeah, she's okay now. It's been five years, I think. It was twenty oh, when awesome. she was diagnosed. That's awesome. It's just such a it was such a scary kind. The triple negative is a very scary kind of breast cancer. But and so yeah. The fact that she survived it and I mean that's you know, that's awesome. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. You know. But I have to be reminded every now and then that it's really still on her mind, in the back of her mind, that this could come back any time. Mhm. Defined, as I said in the book, as likely to come back, not even more likely to come back, but likely. So I, I sort of breeze along, and everything seems okay. And then I realize, because she says something, and I realize she's terrified mm. a lot more of the time than I than I'm aware of. So I have to remember. Mm-hmm. But it is awful. It is the worst thing that can happen to a mother, I think. Right, and you know, only not going to through it with. My mom, I can't imagine because, you know, it's your daughter. It's a completely different thing. It's a completely different yeah, relationship, different you know. It's a completely what different What kind of cancer did your mother have? Um, my mother and father both died of pancreatic cancer. Oh, Christ, that goes fast. Yeah. Goes fast. Well, they were both alcoholics, and um, she, <laughs> she was drinking a lot, of, a lot more alcohol than I was aware of what she was drinking. <laughs> yeah, alcoholics are always drinking more than you have any idea they're drinking. <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, I quit. So it's just, well, I'm oh, really mother. happy to hear that because she really, um, my mother did not recognize, um, she did not, maybe recognize, she did not admit to her alcoholism so much. She was very, very, um, you know, she was very, very happy. Well, we're so good. <laughs> we're so good at convincing ourselves that I'm not drinking at 7.30 in the morning. I'm just spreading my drinking out over the day. <laughs> <laughs> And that seems perfectly okay. <laughs> well, we're right, good at right. ourselves. And we, and you know, you talk about the mother daughter. My mom and I were only seventeen years apart. I have children that are further apart than my mom and I were. So you know, oh, that's we were, very yeah. You know, we oh, were like very, very, very close. Yeah. And so I tried to take the mothering role of now knock it off. <laughs> yeah. And she wanted to say, you're, I'm the mom and you can't tell me what to do. But, you know, it was interesting even seeing your, um, when you were going through quitting smoking, she also died a smoker. Um, her, her cigarettes were her best friends. And she told me that repeatedly, repeatedly. You know, I'm not giving up my best friends. Why would I do that? That makes no uh, sense. Irritating. <laughs> <laughs> there you are taking care of her. Thanks a lot, Mom. <laughs> oh, I know, but you know it's 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 getting easier to understand now because I am getting older. At the time, it wasn't as easy, as easy to understand, but you know we all just do the best that we can do, and it's a it's a path, it's a journey. It's you know it's what we have to go through, and it's what she had to go through. So it was okay. 
<laughs> but, yeah. but I, wow. I did enjoy reading it from your perspective because it did put a whole new perspective for me about it since I've never smoked or drank in any kind of excess. So, you know, from that, per, you know, watching them, it was like I went the other way, you know. And, uh, no, of course. I have you know, to tell you, there's no greater combination than a drink and a cigarette. Well, I imagine. I'm sorry to say. <laughs> no, that's certainly not true. But at the time. Um, right. Yeah. Right. Well, and this book is about, which I didn't, you know, I, like I said, this came up on my, I, I get the top, like whatever audibles that are coming out at the time, I just load them in. And so I know that at the time that I loaded it, I mean, this is a, this is a bestseller. This book made it, you know, all the way up to the top. And it's really about your friendship with a man yeah. that you did not have a relationship with other than friend, right? Yeah, if we wouldn't have been friends this long as we had or, or as we slept together. We've never right. been friends. So he lives a mile away now and um he's still my best friend. And I'm so happy to hear that he's still here too. Like I'm so happy to hear it because I, I was am so too. afraid. <laughs> I was afraid. He's very happy I, to hear it too. Yeah. So he did he um recover from his um, He recovered from from yes, from Hep C with the last drug that was on the market, but he still has, you know, severe cirrhosis, and mm. he should be on the list for a transplant. But, but he's still a uh, Yeah, he's, he's okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, he's fine. Oh, that's awesome. Ish. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, there are things that go wrong if you've had cirrhosis for as long as he has. But he's fine. Right. You know, he's there. He's funny. He's you know, right around the corner. Did, we both did he years. love that you wrote a book about him? I think he was nervous, but it was his idea, so um, there wasn't much he could do about it. And it took seven years, so it's you know, I went through many incarnations till I got the voice right. And then, mm. and, and 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 you know, I when I had written it before Catherine got sick. I realized, well, this really isn't a story. So they were friends, and then this thing happened, and then they were friends again. Mm -hmm. Great. (laughs) But it got so much more complicated when Catherine got sick, and I just didn't know how to write about that. I I just couldn't write about that until one of my dogs ran through the dog dog with her favorite wig. (laughs) And that gave me me a way in because it was an impossible thing to write about just you know, entering through the front door. It was just not, but I couldn't right. really write about it. And, and that's um, the thing about this book is it's written as if it's, it was the easiest thing ever. Like it just flowed. When I, when I read, I read somewhere that it took you seven years to write it. And I couldn't believe that because I, to me, it came across as a book you sat down and wrote in, you know, two sittings. Like it, it just flowed like right out of you, you know? Gosh, that's nice. Thank you. Yeah, it, it didn't. <laughs> well, once I once I figured out uh, once I figured out where to start. There was, was so many things. It was a book that I wrote to him. It was a, a second person book that didn't work. But the, you know, I have this rather spotty memory. But what I do remember, I remember very vividly. And there were so many moments together that I'll never forget. It was the same with all my other my other two memoirs, right? Um, so and that's what I, I love about memoir too, is because of that. You know, memoirs. Yeah. I mean, the way you write it in the chapters that you, the way your style is, there is nothing easier to read about oh. someone. You know, Thanks. because you do. Because when you do remember, I don't know. It's like you know when you sit. If you were to sit down and say, "Okay, I'm going to write an autobiography," like how does that sound? That sounds like ah. I gotta go in order yeah. and <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think of an autobiography as a very extended resume. A memoir is really memory, not fact. It's really um it's a much more fluid thing than in nineteen forty one I was born and then I went to this school and that school and then I got a you know autobiography right. a whole nother a whole nother animal. I guess that's, and that's what I like about it too. Like, I've never even heard that before. It's about memory. I like that. Because yeah, it memory. Is, you know, because unless you're somebody that somebody cares about the facts, 
so much, you know, that they matter. There are no facts. <laughs> there really are no facts. There are dates and there are, there are, this is where I worked, but there are no other facts. Because you remember, I mean, five people remember the same incident in five different ways, and there is no one way. It's the, mm -hmm. you know, and that's what makes it so interesting. It's, it's what you remember is who you are. That's the story you've got. And even if it's a broken narrative or a narrative that goes back and forth, that's who you are. You're this, these pieces put together make, make up the person that you are. And... Memory is a is a is a fantastical creature. And, mm -hmm. You know, it. I think memory is as much about imagination as it is about. I mean, I'm 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 actually thinking of safekeeping, where I remember things from my childhood very differently from the way my sister does, and even if she can say to me, "But this didn't happen." My memory says it does, and I can't uproot what I have always mm -hmm. believed in. I had a, a student once who was told by her mother that she had had a twin brother that died at birth. And it wasn't until she was in her 30s that she found out she had never had a twin brother who died at birth. Now, she can't go back and undo what that did to her, how that shaped her, whatever guilt, whatever sorrow, whatever grief that produced in her. She can't make that go away. Now, just because she finds out 35 years later that it never happened. It's just, memory is memory. Wow. And, um, I know, isn't that an incredible thing? That is really incredible because, you know, especially as we get older, my children will come to me and say, remember when, you know, kind of in that tone, remember when you did this to me? <laughs> remember when yeah, you and of course you have no memory of that. Like, <laughs> or completely wow. different. I am so sorry. I, have, I do not remember doing or saying. Are you sure or, I said that? <laughs> are you sure it was me? I don't remember being that mean. But, but oh. you know, it really does rack you with because you start to think, gosh, was I that? Did I really? I don't remember. You know, and I, and I like, I'll quiz them. Like, well, when was it? And when did? And they're like, oh, mom, just stop. And I'm like, no, I mean, if I said this thing and I did this thing, like, I'd like to know more about it. Like, <laughs> I'm afraid they can't tell you that. <laughs> but right, because our ne because they remember that. They remember yeah. that being the incident. They don't remember yeah. any, because that is what shaped something about them. I guess if you're gonna if it's Absolutely. gonna imprint, right? Uh huh. It is, and there's nothing you can do about it. So get used to it. I mean, I'm sure you are. You have so many kids. <laughs> Fortunately, my one of my daughters has kept a diary since she was about five. And she accused me of something that I knew I hadn't done, and she went back and found her diary. And indeed, I hadn't done it. <laughs> so wow. that was a, a good a good check. That, that is awesome. awesome. I really I wish I would have kept the diary. <laughs> that's what I keep thinking. I wish I would have kept the diary because then I could at least you know battle with some of you know. <laughs> well, that's a fact checker, you know. <laughs> it is a fact checker, and you know it's. It's interesting how the memory works as, you know, like you said, five different people, like both of us were there. They remember it one way. I don't remember it at all. So it wasn't that important in what I was doing at the time, but it was way important for what they were doing at the time. I know. It's fascinating. It's absolutely fascinating. Well, I, when I bought your, so after I listened to your Audible, I bought the book. And because I wanted to, I'm, I'm one of those very strange people that no matter how, even if I get it in Kindle, I have to have the book. I have to. Of so, course. <laughs> Unless you've run out of book space. And oh my, it's you don't thrillers you're know. buying at $25 a pop and you have no bookcases left. And oh then it goes God. on your agenda. I have mm -hmm. stacks and stacks. I feel sorry when, for my children when I die because they're going to be like, what are we going to do with all these? They should just take them to a library, you know, yeah, take them off to the library. To the library. <laughs> but I do. I, I So I bought the book. And um, when I saw the inside cover, and I see that you get a, a little shout out here from Stephen King who says, Abigail Thomas fills memory with living breath. That's awesome. I mean, nice, isn't it? Is that unbelievable? That is just, I was like, That's wow. Really unbelievable. Yeah, that was really nice. That was really nice. Yeah. That was, you know, I mean, I never. It's a I lovely thing I've, to say. And I don't know that I've ever read him on a book before, you know, I, and I have a lot of books, but I don't remember him ever giving a blurb on any books that I have. 
and that's why I don't think he does it. I think he does it with thrillers. I think he does it with books in his genre. Genre, he's a wonderful mm-hmm. writer. Yeah, I think he does mm-hmm. that. But no, I didn't. It was very, very, very nice and generous. It was really mm. nice. Yeah, and and then I was reading. Um, you had given an interview um, to the Huffington Post. And they asked you, what was the joy of being a memorist? And you said, because you can write your way into or out of anything. And yeah. I was like, hmm, how can I write my way out of? Into? <laughs> well, first you have to write in, and then you find that it just writes you. It, after a while, it writes itself. After a while, you know where you're going. But it takes a long mm. time before you know where you want to end it. Because memory really, uh, memoir really is the story of how I got here from there, and you have to figure out what the there is and what the here is. And we've all got, you know, more than one memoir because there are more things. There, there are different. When, when I wrote Safekeeping, I wrote it as a mother and a wife and a woman of the fifties. And when I wrote um, Three Dog Life, it was as a wife. And the mothering part was not part of it. It was all about being a wife whose husband had a traumatic brain injury. And then mm-hmm. when I wrote this one, is, it was as a, as a friend, mostly, but also as a mother. There's mm. different parts of you that take over the different, the different stories you want to tell and stuff that doesn't belong there doesn't belong there. What you don't put in is what gives it its shape, usually. Oh, blah, blah, I blah. like that. <laughs> I like that, what you don't put in. I like that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the title when, when you wrote, you know, What Comes Next and How to Like It, I remember, I think I bought this, I, I was going through my divorce, my second divorce at the time, and I don't think that it was all the way through the court system at this time. I think it took a little bit longer. And, um, and I was thinking, yeah, how do you like what comes next? You know, how do you do that? You know? <laughs> well, first of all, you have no idea what it's going to be. <laughs> right. And you've got to like that, too. Right. It's the last it's... line of a Stephen, Stephen Dobbins poem that I love very much. Oh, nice. I was trying, that's what I wanted to know is, like, where you got that from. Like, yeah, it's Google awesome. it. It's Stephen Dobbins, C-O-B-Y-N-S, and I think it's called How to Like It. I can't remember. It's a wonderful, wonderful poem. Really, really, right, and I can't even read it out loud without bursting into tears in the last five lines. It's a great, great book, great poem. Oh, a wonderful poet. Anyway, well, blah, blah, blah. yeah, I mean, that was just exactly what sums this book up, though. I mean, at the time, you were having to face so much, you know, with your husband dying and then your daughter being diagnosed and then your best friend being diagnosed. It was like going through those thoughts of, you know, what's going to happen and what what's going to happen next and what is, you know, how am I going to deal with it? And um, I did find myself thinking that way a lot after my mom died, you know, because it seems yeah, yeah. like we were so close in age. She died young. But, you know, I was like, I, I felt like I was kept preparing myself for my death. And I was like, then I'd wake up and be like, you're 50. You're not, you know, you, know, you don't have to do this. You don't have to keep preparing. Stop preparing, you know. But it's not yeah. such a bad idea. You know, you want to make death a member of your family so that it doesn't arrive as a stranger by surprise. Because you I really love never that know. I do love you that You never line. know what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. I remember being in my 20s and married and having three kids, and I used to visit this wonderful old woman who lived next door named Mrs. Reeley. And she did say to me once, I don't know what I had said, but she said, you don't know what the future's going to be. You have no idea what can happen next. And I said, of course I do. I'm married to this man, and I've got these kids, and we're going to live happily ever after. We were already miserable, but I was telling myself, that, and then, oh, my God, the crap that came down, which was all actually, thank God, rather interesting. Um, Because that's the good thing about some of the bad shit, that it's it's never boring. It's never boring. I think that if you can get perspective, I think that I have been able to, as I get older, put a little bit of perspective in things um, and not trying to look at them as good or bad and just look at them as events. You know, that's what came next. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's like an event, and I don't have to label it. I can just have it. Because I was the same thing. My second husband, if somebody would have told me we were getting divorced, I would have been like, you are crazy. I am staying married. I am not going through another divorce. It is not happening. And as adamant I was about it, 
it still happened. <laughs> it didn't, you know. And you probably knew it when you said, I'm never getting another divorce. There was some part probably. of you that, of course, I'm getting divorced. <laughs> I can't wait to get divorced. <laughs> <laughs> i, I got to get out of here. I think if you, yeah, d- just protest too much, you know. I think I was protesting too much. Like, no, I think I can. I think I can do this. I can do this. I can be miserable the rest of my life. I know I can. <laughs> yeah, that's when I got my first divorce. I know my lines. I think I can make this work for the rest of my life. Do I really want to do that? Mm. <laughs> do I want to walk on these eggs for the next 50 years? And I went, I left. Oh. Wow. My mom did say before she died, one of the last things she said to me was, you know, just make sure you're happy. And at the time I wasn't. And I was like, <gasps> good luck with happy. Yeah. I know. Happy I is like, an accident. Happy no. is a lovely accident and it goes away. But you can feel good, which is different from being happy. Mm. You can have I a like good that. time. I like that. Yeah. You can have a good time, but happiness is well, something else. I feel like you always have a good time. <laughs> I try to. I'd rather have a good time than a bad time, and I think that's one of the great dividing lines between people because there are people who would really prefer to have a bad time and make it known mm-hmm. <laughs> and have a good time and keep quiet. Well, that, that's <laughs> true. That's true. I mean, I think that if you can always – you know, that's what I love. I love talking to women that, you know, a generation older than me because it's like you you do have more perspective. It's like it's a great perspective. And it's like it, you don't have to be unhappy. you got choices. You have a choice. Yeah. You know? It is wonderful to be 75, I have to tell you. I have never been more comfortable in my body really? than I am now. Really? Yeah, it's wonderful. When I was younger and I had, you know, a little bit, quite a bit, I... Um, I was always looking at who was looking back. And I don't give a shit anymore because nobody is. <laughs> it's really, it's so freeing to be out mm. of the sexual, um, which was such a big move, move, mover and shaker in my life. Wonderful. I yeah. Give a shit. Well, and it's true. I mean, women for at your age, in the se- you know, the, you're in your 70s, when you think about what you have seen, Okay, like you've been through the 60s and you went through this, you know, like you said, you were you wrote a book about parenting in the 50s and 60s and then going through the 70s and 80s. Like you've had to see so many changes, even in the women's movement, um, you know, from stay at home moms and raising your children and then women going out into the work world and then women trying to figure out how to do both. And, you know, you've got to see it all. Yeah, from a rather small perspective, <laughs> because I really wasn't so much, I don't know, I wasn't so much thinking about much of anything except, was this fun or was this not? And mm. when I finally got a job, I absolutely loved it, because I'd never worked before, so I mm. adored it. Mm-hmm. And then when I got into publishing, I really loved it, but I actually didn't, wasn't so much aware of, men and women as I was of people who were willing to say, I love this before finding out what anybody else thought of it. You know, that sticking your, sorry, I'm washing a pot. Um, oh, that's okay. You were, you know, and I, I did want to ask you about that. What was the publishing world like back then? Like what did, it was a lot what, of fun. It wasn't was so it? much about, it wasn't really about the bottom line and how much money the publishing company was going to make, you could publish something just because you absolutely had to publish it, not because you thought you were going to make a gazillion dollars off it. And there was mm. lots of drinking at lunch and knocking over bookcases when you came back. And, <laughs> um, <laughs> so at least one, well, that one moment of that. It was wonderful. It was, but I had no responsibility except for what I, what I loved. And as soon as I was promoted to a moment where I realized, oh, my God, I'm going to have to back this up with numbers and figures, then I left because I really didn't want that responsibility. I just wanted to I absolutely love this. We have to publish this. But once, mm-hmm. you're, once you're a little higher up the ladder, it really matters what you – they'll look at you and say, that sold five copies. You can't buy the next book. Mm. I remember there was a wonderful book called Stones for a Bar, one of my favorite books in the world by Harriet Dorr. And it didn't – you know, there was nothing about it that made you think this was going to be a bestseller, but it was. It was. It was a story about a woman whose husband and and she went 
to Mexico where I think he had grown up or he had ancestors who owned something. And it's a book about stories of her interaction with with Mexicans, but it's always a, it's also a book about her husband's de- death because he was dying then, although they didn't know it. It's 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 a great book, and that we bought because you couldn't not publish it. It was just mm. too good. Mm-hmm. And it, I think it got the National Book Award. It was absolutely. You should read it if you haven't read it. She yeah, I will. I because she was in her late seventies when she published it, her first book. And she wrote a couple of books after that, but that's that's a great book. You should you should really get your hands on it. I will. So and I guess that was met. really yeah, when you could find something like that. Like wasn't that amazing to yes. be able to, you know, find a book and then, you know, have it touch you like that and then just want to get it out there for other people to yeah. see, you know? Yeah. Plus the editing process was almost as good as writing yourself because it's such a creative and intimate thing to do to edit somebody's book. Um, and I really loved that, which is why I still teach and love teaching. It was You're really still teaching? Wonderful. Well, I, te- I don't teach. I do gigs in the summer. I go places that have workshops, but I'm not teaching at the new school anymore. Oh, I have two nice. workshops. One I give at home, and then I give a workshop at the um, Cancer Support Center in Kingston. So it's people writing memoir, who, all of whom have cancer, and I started it after my daughter got better and mm-hmm. we started I was going to do it for like five weeks and it's been five years now Wow! and we've lost a lot of people which has been terrible but I learned more on those Thursday afternoons about the meaning of right this minute now than I ever would have any other way the, mm. the people in this workshop are more alive facing death than anybody I know and they're all mm. patients. They all have metastatic. Most of them have metastatic cancer of one kind or another. And they're so alive. And isn't really that is so that is so awesome? Because if we only understood that, I think that that's just more of a reality. So then they can. But it's like we're we're in, everybody's in the same boat. We all kind like you said. You don't know. We have no idea what's going to happen. But no, we don't no. live that minute to minute like we should. You know. Yeah. Well, it, it's more fun, mm-hmm. unless the minute sucks, and then you just have to wait for the next <laughs> for the next <laughs> moment to arrive. Right. Right. Anyway, that's that's what I do. It's not teaching really either. It's more more making suggestions and encouraging because mm-hmm. you learn a whole lot more when you're encouraged to do something that you're good at, even if it's just one sentence out of fifteen pages, and you say, "Start here." And then they mm. suddenly realize, oh yeah. Start mm. Anyway, um, but that's yeah, awesome. I'm yeah. really that's that's just to be able to help other people like that. I mean, that's you know to get it. Well, and it's I'm wonderful. Sure, you know, so blessed to have you there, you know, to help them. Yeah, but I'm that's I'm also blessed. very lucky to have them because at least on on Thursdays I learn more than than they do. <laughs> right. Although right, we, it's a pretty tight group. Pretty tight group. Anyway. Well, that's awesome. Thank you so much, Abigail. This has been so much fun. I'm really happy. I was so happy to have found you, and I'm so happy to have found your book. I mean, it meant it meant every every page meant so much to me. Um, oh, thank I, you. I loved your journey, and I know that other people have also loved your journey. Also, you know, along with me. Thank and, you. Uh, that's, that's nice of you to say. Are you? Are, do you see another book coming this way? Nope. No, every single memoir has been has been prompted by some great loss, and I'm not looking for the next memoir. <laughs> mm, right. I'm not looking for the next loss. Um, but I am fiddling around with poetry, which is a lot of fun. This is what I started out by writing. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's fun. You know, oh. I have no confidence, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I and and you also you paint. Much. You also paint too. I do, so. yeah, I do, and that's really that's really fun too. That's because you don't know what you've got until you until you turn the glass over and see. Oh my God, look at that! Right. Um, awesome. And then you just sort of enhance the accident to make a painting. Yeah, I love to do that. I love well, to do that. I'm I'm so happy I came across your books, and I I hope that you are get better every day. And thank you. That's right. <laughs> I have a concussion. All of you out there. <laughs> In case I made no sense, oh, no, I have an excuse. Sense. 
So you made perfect <laughs> sense. And I'm, uh, and we're all very blessed to have, have been able to hear what you had to say. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Don't forget to send me the link to your to your. Um, to, I will. Uh, I will send um, you the link. YouTube thingy. Yes, and I will put your links underneath here for everybody so they can find you and find your books on Amazon. And oh, you know. thanks. Okay, so All right. you have a great day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, okay. bye-bye. Bye-bye.